Hello. I have just tried to get Aiden to sleep and I don't know if he's going to stay asleep so I might have to cut this really short but I wanted to um, do something with a different part of my brain because I've been thinking about family and all that sort of stuff all week and um, just be nice to dabble in history again because this is where my heart is most of the time. Hey, Hole, how are you going? Um, I was just saying, I hope that Eamon will stay asleep. My things are fogging up. Um, so I've got some old lectures that I wrote when I've been teaching at different universities, which I can, um, which I can start speaking to if people are interested. And one of my old students from Papua New Guinea has asked me to talk about decolonisation in PNG and whether it was the right time or not. So Papua New Guinea gained independence in 1975 and one of the biggest debates amongst historians has been whether it was the right time or not, whether uh, whether the systems were ready, whether the people were ready and all of that sort of thing. So I'm just going to scroll through. If I look down, it's because I'm looking at my PowerPoints from a couple of years ago. Um so at the time there's a whole big history of colonization in Papua New Guinea there are multiple colonial powers that operated there so the northern part of what is now Papua New Guinea was under German rule for a while and then during World War One, that transition to Australian rule the southern part of what is now Papua New Guinea was under British control and then that transition to Australian control at the turn of the 20th century. Um, I think the Papuan Act came in in 1905 which was the legislation that kind of executed all that. Um, so Australia by the time World War II happened and by the time the the big calls for decolonisation were going on around the world were going on, Australia was the one acting as a colonial power to Papua, Papua and New Guinea. Okay, so that meant that it was instrumental in the whole process of decolonisation as much as it had been instrumental in setting up the territory's trusteeship systems and stuff. So they were mandated to control um, Papua and New Guinea through the League of Nations, um, especially after World War one that's that's talking more specifically about the northern part which had been german controlled um but then with the end of world war Two, there was a huge global push to start decolonizing this had been sort of there'd been little movements here and there through the pacific demanding more power be with the um, indigenous people of the place but it had not really gained momentum and this is, it's really after World War II that there's an external pressure to push um, the, ex, like the European powers out of PNG and elsewhere. So that's, that was the climate and World War II contributed as well because by the end of World War II, the Australians were generally saying that things had changed so much and Papua New Guineans had had such a change in lifestyle and more control than they had had prior to the war that there would no, be no way to kind of re re-establish the balance where the Australians were on top. So there was a lot of concern about that going on at the time, uh, especially because um, there had been the Papuan Infantry Battalion and Papuans had been armed to serve with military in, in all that. So there was a big push um, at the under the Curtin Chifley government that was operating. Um, they started to make plans for post war Papua New Guinea, and the rhetoric was to push for development and greater autonomy for the people of Papua New Guinea, but also to protect Papua New Guinea as a bit of a buffer between Australia and Asia because they were still really thinking through World War Two and the Japanese threat to um, the borders. And there's a whole, there's, um, there was one book that I read that stayed with me all the way through undergrad and beyond uh, about 
anxious, I think it's called Anxious Nation. I'll try and find the reference if anyone's interested. But it's all about Australia's anxiety about Asia and Asia as a threat. Uh, and you can see that in the d- dialogue and discourse and media and stuff that we still get. Um, let me just scroll down and see where the most interesting bits are. I think really I should try and stick. I don't want to give a full-blown lecture. I have lots of information here. Um, so one of the things I wanted to say was that there were lots of different strands of the um, government that needed to be prepared for decolonisation. So one was um, the health sector. So at the end of World War Two, the director of um, the Department of Public Health was appointed and he was stationed in Port Moresby um, in a very basic hut with a mud floor and tin roof. And then there was um, an increase in people going up to practice medicine and then train Papua New Guinean doctors. Um, so that was one of the sectors in which they looked for. Um, the One of the guys who was involved was John Gunther and he employed people for the territory, which um, there are about 40 doctors for Papua New Guinea. Um, people who had completed a secondary school education would attend the Suva Medical School. So Suva Medical School really became a hub for the Pacific and training up um, nationals for service in, in the health sector. So that was still happening. This is like early 1950s that that was really stepping up. Same with education. So there was the first director of education appointed in the early 1950s. I think it was 1952. Um, that was W.C. Groves. And he was talking about whether they start really investing in training Papua New Guineans in trade. Um, there had been a lot of education supplied by missions. And so there were um, efforts made to think beyond that system and try and establish government-run schools more and also to extend the efforts for developing cash cropping to villages um, beyond plantations. So there'd been a lot of plantation labour going on in Papua New Guinea as well. And so they really needed to overhaul the education system in order to get people trained up in different areas for governance as well as um, industry and that sort of stuff. So they wanted to try and develop an autonomous economy that didn't rely on any other external countries. Um, okay, so there's a bit about the United Nation and that sort of thing. Okay, so um, the Australian government had tried to adopt a policy for gradualism, so very slowly, slowly, gently, gently approach. And then... Um, that's why it took so long. So after World War II, that's 1945, and then it's not until 1975 that independence comes in. And there's lots of different steps along the way that were taken. And then you've got the rise of Papua New Guinean political parties, like the Pangu Party, which was run by Sir Michael Samare, who's um, become such a huge figure in Papua New Guinea. Um Okay, so I'll just skip ahead. Um, there's so much in this lecture. <laughs> uh, I don't know if anyone else finds that they go back through their slides and go over overboard. Um, so Wayne asked whether Papua New Guinea was ready for decolonisation. I think it's all well and good to say one way or the other, but this, I what I would say is that Australia never really invested in the territories of Papua and New Guinea with the thought that they would have to ready them for independence. That is my impression. That That's kind of comparing them with places like Fiji where I've looked at the mission histories and always the missionaries were at least talking about transitioning authority and power over to Fijians. Um, and I think that there is an element of that in Papua New Guinea, but I've been looking at this biography um, of Isoli Salen, who's from New Ireland. And 
there's just, I mean, he got educated down here in Australia and that could be seen as them trying to develop an elite leadership. But then there were so many blockages to him really excelling as a leader um, with him being undermined too with by people's attitudes more than anything else. So I think that the whole process was actually undermined by people's attitudes t um, towards Papua New Guineans. That would be... That would be my answer. And then, uh, but, um, and you can kind of see that in the way that Sir Michael Samari was talking about it at the time when he was leader of the Pangu Party. He was saying that he wished people would give them the benefit of the doubt that if rural transition to Papua New Guinea is that it wouldn't all turn to crap. So you can get the sense of the frustration with the negative rhetoric that was circulating around. Um, yeah, whether or not they were um, Papua New Guinea was ready, well, it's happened now, <laughs> Wayne. So, um, I think what is probably a better question is how do you strengthen what's there now? Can you learn from the systems that people experimented with through the process of decolonization and either strengthen or change what's going on? Um, so. For example, there was a system pushing for decentralisation of government, so moving power out to towns and villages rather than holding it all in Port Moresby in Waigani. So uh, whether that system is the best for PNG, I think there's still like a shift backwards and forwards from that every now and again. So, yeah, that... That's my response to that question. If anyone's got any other history questions, I'd be very keen to talk about it. This is a very um, casual talk because I've just had a very long day uh, with the boys and I've been a little bit worried that Eamon would wake up through the middle of this. But uh, hopefully it gives you a little bit of background and there's just so much more I could talk about, but that gives a little bit of a brief discussion and I was just talking to I had a big meeting with people today from the lifestyle suite and we were talking about how people who um, from academia or a certain industry when they engage with media or social media they go way too over the top with um, detail and becomes lost uh, you know we've got to try and cut out all the specifics and not be so worried about about that so that we can actually talk about stuff in a way that means something to people. Anyway, I'm totally rambling now. I uh, hope you've all had a reasonable day and are not feeling too flat or anxious or anything like that. Um, yeah, I know a lot of people are having a really tough time and just um, I hope that even if you just listen to the playlist Tess and I came up with today, I've been really enjoying that. Um, so you've got some options with your choice of music there and um, yeah maybe you're just taking some time to do things that you've been putting off for a little while or having a rest <laughs> all right I'll catch you guys tomorrow I'll try and do a live in the morning I think my theme was going to be um, managing expectations from work as well as family all at once <laughs> so um yeah, if anyone's got anything else you want me to talk about or just, uh, even if I just make a cup of tea and sit here so people feel like I'm floating around so that you've got something regular to, because Beck was saying this morning that she's just enjoying that I'm there even if she can't engage with me on here because she's got her hands full. So that's kind of nice. Um, yeah, anyway, you guys have a good night, have a good sleep and I'll talk to you soon. <laughs>